call this meeting to order. It is 7 p.m. on Tuesday, September 5th, 2017. This is a regular meeting of the Richfield School Board. In attendance this evening, we have Superintendent Unowski and board members Tim Paulus, Crystal Brocky, John Ashmead, Peter Tensing, and Paula Cole, and I'm Christine Malik. I would like to remind um, all of us of the Richfield Public Schools mission statement. Um, Richfield Public Schools inspires and empowers each individual to learn, grow, and excel. And we will keep this in the forefront of our minds as we work together this evening. Um, we will start out with review and approval of the agenda. If there is any member prepared to move the agenda as presented. I'll move the agenda. Sorry. We have a motion by Ms. Brocky, a second by Ms. Cole. Is there any discussion? All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? The chair votes aye and the agenda is approved. Um, we have no requests for public comment this evening, so we will move on to information and proposals and non-action items and information from school sources. So starting with the superintendent update. All right, so we have several things that we are going to provide updates on today. Um, first thing is we're going to provide a brief update on the first day of school because obviously this was the first day of school in Richfield Public Schools. Um, we actually produced a short video just to give some visuals about what our students and what our staff experienced today. So with that, Dr. Roby. scenes from each of our schools obviously all of our schools were in action our step started actually almost three weeks ago um, and our other traditional schools started today um, things went very smoothly at each of our schools um, for an enrollment update and we'll provide an official update um, in the coming weeks um, we do a lot of student counts on the first days of school um, and so in terms of actual student counts we're actually sitting um, students actually in the building around 25 elementary students up um, from our projection um, which is a good sign on the first day it's causing a couple of areas with bubbles that we are monitoring um, and so there's a couple of class sizes at stem in the upper grades we are keeping a close eye on and also at rdls in the lower grades we're keeping a close eye on um, we're going to continue monitoring enrollment um, across all of our schools throughout the course of the week and the next week um, to make whatever adjustments that we need to make. Um, but overall, excited staff, happy kids, happy families, and you saw a lot of scenes of um, a lot of families dropping their kids off at schools today. Um, and so we got a lot of parent involvement on that first day and, and excited teachers and excited kids. So it was a great first day overall. Um, one of the things that sets us up to have a positive first day, I'm gonna make a slight change to the agenda. Um, I had planned a strategic plan and superintendent goal update next, but I'm actually gonna invite our three staff members up to report on summer school. Um, because one of the things that really sets us up for a great first day of school is to have a highly effective summer school program. We really, really work to close the gap and accelerate our learning for each of our kids. And so you see in front of you today, um, our program leads, um, Joey Waters and Melissa Ness, and then Ryan Finke, assistant principal from the middle school. And they are here to uh, share with you an update and a, re a reminder of the things that occurred um, during our summer school programming. With that, um, is there a microphone up there? There is not. 
That's all right. So we will go without it, and it may or may not make the video, but that's all right. I was just yes. going to say, teacher, <laughs> teacher voice in action. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, so we'll just do introductions. Um, I'm Julie Waters. I am one of the summer school coordinators. And um, for the school year, I am a new peer reviewer. So I used to be a fourth grade teacher at Centennial. My name is Melissa Nass. I am the other elementary summer school coordinator. And during the school year, I am an instructional coach at the language school. Good evening, all. My name is Ryan Pinky. The last two years, I served as a dean of students at the middle school. And this year, I'm getting my first year as the assistant. So today we have three things that we wanted to talk to you about. Um, well, so when you leave here, you can um, understand where we're coming from as far as summer school. The first one is just learn how summer school programming is aligned to the Richfield Public Schools mission and the strategic plan. We also want to identify updated information and data regarding our summer school programming. And the third thing is to understand how summer leaders use data um, to improve the summer programming for students. So our, our summer school vision aligns to the RPS mission, and um, you can see on the bottom is the vision for summer school. Um, it aligns the learn. Um, in summer school, we do science-based learning, experiential learning, and we focus on constructive experiences. So our K-4 summer program is held at STEM. Um, each grade level has a science theme, and we the curriculum was developed by summer by teachers in Bridgefield and aligned um, with our reading, writing, and math curriculum during the school year. So our um, writing is aligned not only to the science team, but also we use the practice curriculum, which is what teachers are trained on in the school year. So it's a nice um, just continuation. And we're also focusing on informational writing. And then the literacy is integrated into the science and the math is based on and it includes pre and post assessment. assessments. Uh, this is a copy of the schedule that we used for summer school. Each grade level, as you can see, has 60 minutes of experiential learning, um, at least 75 minutes of literacy, 75 minutes of math, and 60 minutes of specialist, which includes art, media, music, and diet. So one of the learn areas that we have for summer school was we were bringing four um, elementary schools together and so being that the four elementary schools do different um, behavior plans, we wanted to make sure that we were all unified and one of the ways was using um, PBIS, which is the Positive Behavior Intervention Supports. And so this is a student um, engagement system to provide social emotional support. And we do that um, on the bus, we do that before school, during breakfast, um, during lunch, in the hallways, classrooms. And ways that teachers do it is we have what's called a Spartan Pride ticket. We use that where kids can earn those for academics and for doing positive behavior things. And then each week we have um, a drawing and we call kids down. So it's kind of an excitement thing, but it definitely brings all the teachers um, together and students and we're all on the same page. Two new additions in our 2017 program uh, was something called the JUMP Academy. JUMP stands for Join Us for Math and Picture and Writing. This is a program that um, targets our EL students level one and twos. It's taught by EL teachers that have been trained in a program called Picture and Writing. <coughs> um, and the other one is Math and Reading Intervention Support, which was new in 2017. We had two reading interventionists and two math interventionists who were able to work with small groups of students on targeted skills. So some of, another thing for the program overview is uh, we, had, we were able to clock six and a half hours a day, so that includes some of the social emotional pieces that we did on the bus, in the lunchroom, where we could teach PBIS. So we had about 674 students registered the first day. So we were up from last year, um, which was about 647. Uh, our daily average attendance was about 593. So we want to continually improve that, but definitely an improvement from the previous summer. And some of the things that we changed, we did have a family outreach worker, uh, which this person went to homes, called parents, um, was really involved in the community and getting kids to school so she would find out why kids weren't here and how can we help you get here. So I think that was um, a testament to why our enrollment was up. We also had 
parent uh, phone calls, robocalls, emails, and then one of the biggest things is on the last day of school, we have a parent open house. So parents are able to come in, um, each grade level has a project. So the parents were able to come in and view the projects, um, meet the teachers, look at their ILPs, and kind of learn about what the, what the student did all summer. So it was really good and successful. So each student in summer school is re required to have an ILP, an individual learning plan. Um, and so our individual learning plan included writing data, math data, and social emotional data. Um, and then with that, we had weekly PLCs to discuss student growth and instructional strategies. So according to our ILP, students in every grade level improved in um, both writing and math. And then as Joey said, we each grade level has a science-based project that they present on the last day. And then this is a copy of the ILP. Um, it shows how students are expected to improve in writing, math, and then social emotional. So writing is aligned to Lucy Hawkins. Math is standard-based number sense. And social emotional is based on a program that we've started on board. Um, and the specialists are um, in charge of um, kind of rolling out those strategies and aligning those to the classrooms. This is a slide of some of our data from our intervention program. One of the things that we wanted to see this summer is if interventionists were making a difference in, in the data and if it was an effective thing to continue. And what we found was that um, in every grade level, a significant number of students made progress in both math and reading with intervention support. And so just as an example, first grade, 100% of students improved in both reading and math um, that received intervention support. Some of the staffing um, that we had for summer, we had two coordinators, which was Melissa and I. Um, we had 35 licensed teachers. We had the four um, math and reading interventionists. Um, we had nine paraprofessionals, and we had four clerical and one nurse, so about 55 staff, um, which was kind of similar to how our budget was the previous year. So here's just some pictures of some of the things that happened. You know, these are the first graders. The force in nature, they did the kites, so the wind socks that they're, they're demonstrating. The other picture is the kids at Wood Lake. So again, some of the kids at Wood Lake, um, again, the first graders with force in nature with the, the bolts that they were learning about. So at the end of each summer school, we, we thought it was very valuable to do a staff survey. Um, and this, besides the data from the classroom, was what we use to kind of determine what our needs are going forward. So first thing on the staff survey, what we asked teachers was obviously what grade or what involvement they had in summer school. And then we also wanted to know if they were a part of the JUMP program because we wanted to differentiate them from a normal classroom teacher. And then we felt what we wanted to know is the administrative team. So it was made up at the elementary school of Melissa and I and Jason Sellers at the time. Um, us three, and so we wanted to know, did the teachers feel supported? Did they feel like they, it was a successful um, team? And overall, you can see that they did feel supported and they felt that it was really successful. Another area that we wanted to collect feedback on was PLCs to determine whether teachers felt that they were useful during the summer. And these are just a um, few examples of some of the comments in the survey. One of them, SEL, social Social emotional learning was the best fit for specialists. I think they should be the focus again next summer. The next one um, is definitely the PBIS. We wanted to know is do teachers feel that that's a valuable tool for us to use to bring the four elementary schools together? <laughs> um, and you can see some of the comments that the tickets were great as specialists. Um, they gave me a chance to highlight some of the great behaviors. Um, so it really gave teachers and staff um, an opportunity to celebrate what kids were doing well instead of the other end of the spectrum. And then some of the miscellaneous feedback, we just asked if the teachers had any other comments or anything else that they wanted to share. Um, some of the things they just said, you know, great job to you for making summer school truly enjoyable to be um, at for teachers as well as students. Um, so that was really important. I thought that was really one to highlight because Teachers get burnt out at the end of the year, and for a teacher that 
goes an extra two months and can still say that, I mean, that's a good feeling and we feel good about that. So using a survey, we set some goals. Melissa and I, this, is, this part is just for the elementary piece. We felt like there were four things that we wanted to either continue or we wanted to make improvements going forward. And again, we used the survey and we also used the data that we collected. So Melissa's gonna talk about goal one and two and then I'll talk about goal three and four. So the first goal is to expand immersion programming by recruiting more students and creating curriculum. Um, right now, we currently have kindergarten, first, and second grade that um, can receive instruction in Spanish for DLS students, and so one of our goals is to expand that and also um, adapt the curriculum so that um, more students can um, benefit from immersion programming. That's based on survey results and also um, teacher feedback. The next goal, continue to make small revisions to math and writing curriculum along with some major revisions to reading and jump. And this goal will happen all throughout the school year. Um, we will work with teachers to revise the curriculum um, and we will also collaborate with the director of math, director of literacy, and the director of Yale. So the third goal that we had is we want to um, develop uh, partnerships to support summer um, school programming vision. One of the newest ones that we had this summer was the Wildlife ref Refuge. Um, and what we did was we had teachers teach a science curriculum in the classroom and then they went out to the Wildlife Refuge and were able to explore and do other activities. So we thought that was really good, but one of the feedbacks that we got from teachers was they didn't know the actual Wildlife Refuge site. So when they got out there, they didn't feel as comfortable. So one of the supports we want to continue is maybe give them some uh, PD around teaching the lessons and then actually knowing where the stuff is once they get out there. So that could be done that first week before summer school starts. And then other uh, partnerships we were thinking about, um, there was an opportunity um, the Minnesota Vikings have. They're starting what's called a STEM um, science program out at their new facility with the, um, the new training camp site. So it's brand new, they don't have everything aligned and set up yet, but some of the things that I've been you know, talking with them about is, you know, what will that look like and maybe how we can partner to get our summer school kids maybe out there to do some different science, math, or different activities, um, either through summer school, during the school year, or some various things. So that program is to come. It's kind of in the works right now. We're trying to get some ideas. So. And then the fourth goal is to expand the interventionist program. So like I said, we had two reading and two math. We feel with some of the feedback and some of the results that we got, we want to expand it excuse me, to uh, three reading and three math, which would allow um, more classrooms to be able to uh, benefit from that. And like I said, some of the comments here that the interventionist didn't work with my students. I'd like to know, you know what services they have. So we want to be able to uh, we have opportunities to all the classrooms, and to do that, we need to expand. So that's one of our areas. So that's the K four part. So I'm going to hand it off to Ryan. He can talk about the six eight and the high school. Uh, so you're going to notice as I begin speaking, you're going to hear a lot of similarities or a lot of themes that are common both to the K four program, or excuse me, K five as well as the six eight. Uh, the reason for that is over the last two to three years through the leadership of Jason Sellers and Dr. Obi, one of the things that we have worked really hard as coordinators and then as staff is to have a consistent um, summer school program that we, are, that we are offering for students K-12. So as you go through, you're gonna hear some of the similar themes and the things that I'm saying. Um, that is intentional and it has been intentional and it's been through a lot of hard work from coordinators, Dr. Obi, um, Mr. Sellers, and then our staff will put in a ton of time. So I just wanted to say that on the outset. Um, all of our students, six through eight, are housed at the middle school. And again, just like the elementaries, our focus over the last couple of years has been on project-based learning, experiential learning, things that our students can have hands-on learning experiences um, throughout the summer. We've also added, similar to the elementary school, had the opportunity to train our L teachers in picturing writing which was a great opportunity for them to be able to use not only through summer school, but also now something that they're implementing throughout the school year as well. 
We've also added uh, for this year a math interventionist team building enrichment course, as well as bringing in some social emotional supports for our middle school kiddos. And I'll talk about that here in just a minute. We also continue to have a focus on writing. Uh, we use the six traits of writing as a basis of what we did for summer school, focusing particularly on organization, sentence fluency, and ideas. So really focusing on those core components of writing to help uh, improve our students' reading and writing. The other piece that we added for this year was to really look at our community relationships, to add some of those field trips uh, that tied in, that gave students not only an engaging experience, but also tied in really well with the curriculum. The piece that, you're gonna, that you see on your screens or if you see up on the board, this is the schedule that we created for the middle school. And what you're going to notice is we have our core classes in math and reading, but then we also have our enrichment. We have science exploratories, we have tech or computer literacy, and one of the big pieces that we added this year was partnering with our headway therapists that we use throughout the school year to bring in some social emotional classes. Um, we also had Monique Tway, who was a social worker out of Brooklyn Park School District, who worked with us for the summer, and she spent, um, spent the summer working with all of our sixth grade students. So every one of our sixth grade students who were there for summer school had a 10 day rotation of mindfulness strategies that Monique is very passionate about and has had a lot of training on and brought to us. So all of our sixth grade students had a 10 day rotation of those. Um, and then all of our seventh and eighth grade students also had pull out classes and groups with um, Miss Leeper and Miss Lee, so that they also got to experience a lot of those social emotional pieces that, especially at middle school, uh, we think is very crucial. And we also brought in Mr. Cunningham as one of our enrichment classes. He focused on team building activities. So he would pull small groups of students out from their other exploratory classes and would work on a variety of team building um, and tied to social emotional, but really just getting kids up and moving around. So you can see bottom right, one of my favorite pictures from summer school. Mr. Cunningham had all the kids down in the gym and they were working as a team to use all of these different props and then at the end of each session, you would have them sit down and talk about what they learned through that experience. Just as last year, um, we used project-based learning and theme-based learning for each one of our grades. And you'll see for sixth grade, the question was, why is resilience essential in life? And that was a great question because we were able to partner with the YMCA they actually use the middle school throughout the summer for their summer camps. So we were able to partner with them and actually had our students go out to Camp Kijiapi in Prior Lake. And the students got to really kind of toggle with that question of resiliency and what does it mean to, even though you might not get knocked down, to get back up, to move forward, um, whether that be in school, life. They had a chance to interview parents or somebody else that they know who might have had a tough experience. For seventh grade, it was who am I and what factors shape my identity. Again, we're really trying to build on this notion of when they come to us as sixth graders, it's really finding themselves, finding out what they need to do. But then as they continue through seventh grade, it's really understanding the world around them to get to understand um, that not everyone might look like them, um, act like them. And so we brought the students to the Minnesota Science Museum to the race, are we so different? And that was the, the culminating field trip project um, for seventh grade. For eighth grade, as we start looking at college and career readiness, we focused our question on choices. How can a person's decisions and actions change his or her life? And again, really focusing and building on now that you're in eighth grade and you're getting prepared for high school, where do you wanna be next year, two years from now, 10 years from now? And so a lot of those different things that the, the students focused on was not just preparing for college, but also looking at, do you wanna potentially go to the military? Do you wanna work right out of school? What skills do you need to do all of those things? And to really start looking at how your choices today can greatly impact what you do a year from now, 10 years from now. And the final piece for that was we actually had a great partnership with Leonardo's Basement and all of our eighth grade students were able to go to Leonardo's basement. And if you haven't had the opportunity, I'll just give a quick shout out to them because they were amazing. 
you go there, the students went there and just got to tear apart computers, DVDs, old video consoles, all kinds of stuff. They came back at the end of the day with contraptions that they had created after just tearing things apart for the first hour and a half and really kind of seeing what the inside of a massive copier looks like or seeing what the inside of an old school Pac-Man video game looks like. So it's a great opportunity for them to see just all the different things out there and then to come back with a physical piece at the end of the day was a lot of fun. Similar to elementary, our individual learning plan separated out by reading, writing, math, and then the social emotional. And you'll see the concepts that we are really focusing on in math are uh, separated by the Minnesota State Standards. And so students were given both pre-assessments and post-assessments on each one of those pieces. Um, our school day is a little bit shorter. We have four and a half hours per student each day. One of the pieces that, again, I think speaks very, very highly to the work that our staff did, not only last year, but coming into this summer. Our average daily attendance this year was 235 students. Last year, our average daily attendance was 185. And if you know middle school, getting a 12, 13, 14-year-old to come in the middle of the summer um, can be a task. But again, one of the things I shared with, with the staff, the fact that we got them in the door and they were able to hold them, uh, I, again, I think just speaks volume to the work that our staff did this year to really build an engaging curriculum and a curriculum that really met the needs of our kids. We also had uh, parent and community engagement through newsletters and then daily attendance calls to help make sure our students were getting there. This is a brief snapshot. In our PLCs, our PL, the work of our PLCs was based on data-driven decision-making. The slide that you see in front of you is our sixth graders. This is total scores, uh, both reading comprehension and then the three areas of writing, and then math down below. And you can see the pre-scores and then the post. Um, and you'll notice across the board, we saw great growth, specifically in writing. If you take something like uh, writing based on ideas, the concept of ideas, the pre-test 36 students were scoring basic. After the post-test, it was down to 29 and 17. We're now showing exemplary on those uh, on that concept. So again, using the data to help drive our instruction for not only this year, but what we hope to do moving forward as well. In total, we have two coordinators, myself and Ms. Luann Tower, who's a special ed lead up at the high school. She served as our primary um, administrator for our special ed students as well. Um, similar survey given at the middle school. It was myself as the primary administrative team, and then just looking at overall staff satisfaction. But we used a lot of this data um, to again, determine what we want to do moving forward. What we heard from staff is they really liked the social emotional pieces. They really liked the fact that they had the time at the beginning of the summer to get prepared and to have time to plan with their colleagues. <coughs> and then we also heard, um, we had great feedback about our math interventions. This was the first summer that we had one person specifically just doing small groups uh, as a math interventionist. And overall, staff felt that was very helpful and beneficial, and our data supported that as well. Steps moving forward. Over the last two years, we've really focused on our reading and writing curriculum. Moving forward, we'd like to look at our math curriculum and really start doing an intense overhaul of, of how we um, work with our students and the curriculum that we have over the summer. We'd also like to continue to work with our partnerships and to build the partnerships with the YMCA, with Leonardo's Basement, and other community organizations. Um, in a lot of ways, it's an untapped potential that I think we can do a much better job of. We also want to expand more enrichment opportunities for students who may excel in one or many disciplines or concepts to make sure that we are meeting the needs of all of our students and to provide even more opportunities um, for our students so that they can do a variety of different things throughout summer and then continue to expand our interventionist program, not only through the social emotional, but also offering more classes and more activities like the team building um, that we really piloted this year. Not only is it engaging, but it was also ext extremely beneficial for our students.
to finish up, I have four slides on the 9 through 12 program. I can give you a brief uh, overview on our 9 through 12 summer program. Um, some of the key, key aspects is this program, just like last year, is an independent study. It's hours based upon credit completion, and students have the opportunity to earn between one and three credits. Um, throughout this program, there are four and a half licensed teachers in social studies, math, science, and LA language arts to help support the students with that process. This year, the average daily attendance was 45 students. And of the 95 students who, or excuse me, of the 95 start dates, there were 25 credits um, earned as part of the credit recovery program. One of the very unique pieces um, that we have also is our Spartan Camp, and that is for our incoming ninth graders. Our incoming ninth graders have the opportunity to attend Spartan Camp, really familiarize, helps familiarize themselves with the uh, high school, focus on relationship building, interdisciplinary approach to learning, and by being a part of Spartan Camp, students have the opportunity to earn up to a quarter of an elective credit. There are 53 students registered, and there was an average daily attendance, again, of about 45 students. Of those 45 students, 28 students earned credit through this, through the Spartan Camp program. And again, you'll hear the, the same type of theme, really uh, the focus moving forward for the 9 through 12 program, similar to the K-8 program. We want to continue to build upon the community relationships that we've had, that we have had, and will continue to have moving forward. The focus on project-based learning, so that we have an engaging curriculum that students want to take part of, and that we're meeting their needs. And then science-based and experiential learning as well. And then the final piece would be to continue to look at curriculum. I think if you would talk to any of the coordinators standing up here. Um, or that we have, or the teachers that have done the work. We know that we've done a lot of work over the last couple of years, but we have a lot of work left to do. Um, and so we'll continue to work on that curriculum and, and increase those opportunities. And then they continue to work on refining PLCs. That's a brief overview of the 6th grade program and the 9th through 12th program. Let's move ahead. Are there any questions for our team members? Um, so really interested to hear about the PBIS strategy that you're implementing. My understanding is that PBIS is a strategy that's been in place at least at some of our K-5 buildings for a while. Um, I'm really excited, at least what I'm hearing, and this is me maybe extrapolating a little bit as far as the um, really nice overlap between PBIS and the Classroom classroom mm -hmm. um, in terms of finding a good and child and um, positive behavior or mental strategies to talk about. So my question is, um, and I should probably know this, but it might be, is PBIS a strategy that we're employing district-wide, or was this an opportunity for some of our staff who got uh, to sort of learn and experience PBIS for the first time? And then follow-up question would be, um, I don't know if any of you have completed this in the classroom, but tell me if, if you sense that there's a goal on yeah, so last summer, so the last school district I was in, I was trained in PBIS. So last year, this is my second year as a coordinator, and so one of the things is we wanted to find something that we could bring the four elementary schools together. And so I had made a suggestion that PBIS was an option. I know that the RSM school already currently uses it. So it was something that one of the schools were already familiar with. And so we've done the, P, the PD training um, in the beginning of summer school for all the other three um, schools to kind of bring them together. I'm not trained in Innocent Classroom, but it is definitely, from what I'm learning now, is um, definitely a good mix. And so we're trying to figure out a way that definitely when kids come to summer school that it's kind of cohesive and the same. So One of the really positive and things to look at for our team at summer school was they helped sort of a year ago as they moved down this road introduced the idea sort of organically of what if all the buildings had similar behavior systems in place. Correct. Um, and, and so what happened is the summer school staff came back talking about their great experience with PBIS and what you see now and across all of our elementary schools is there's a wide range and almost our entire staff being envoy trained, um, which is 
a way to also engage students in a similar type of way and de-escalate um, rather than escalate. Um, and so what we see happening in summer school is some of those innovative practices that we want across our entire organization and they help us move things forward as we see them model for us some of the best practices that really allow them to go organically and grow across our system. And just to add to that, and Melissa has a comment. So because um, most of the schools are getting trained in Envoy, that's something that we also are going to add in for the K-4 summer school. Um, we feel that's a good match with the PBIS for the classroom piece. Um, just an example of how PBIS kind of organically helped a strategy move from summer to a regular school program is some of the teachers from RDLS that worked summer school um, really appreciated the concrete behavior supports that PBIS offers and so we've created a modified um, system of what happens in summer at our school during the school year. Um, so second question um, and this is maybe as much of a reflection as a question or just maybe a discussion point. Um, one of the things that, um, as a parent of teenagers, um, that I am becoming more acutely aware of is the uh, levels of anxiety and depression that we see among, among children and teens these days, and that it's far higher than it would have been in prior generations. Um, I don't know if anybody knows exactly why. Um, there's all kinds of theories about um, you know, living in the information age and, and what does that do. Um, one of the pieces that, and this is again just very anecdotal in terms of feedback that I've heard from my own kids, is this feeling that they sometimes can hear of, and I heard a little bit of this in, in some of the uh, material that Mr. Pink was presenting, um, this feeling that here you are, you know, early in your life, and, and already if you haven't succeeded now, then you've you've lost an opportunity. Um, you know, this notion that well, if you can, if you can, you know, what you do now has impacts down the road, and, and so I guess one of the pieces that, as a parent, um, I've always not, I mean, would have to give credit to my wife probably uh, to be really honest, but you know, um, taking these taking these challenges, right, but turning that on its head and say it's not so much a challenge as it is an opportunity. Um, and so I'm hearing, I'm hearing a little bit of that from sort of the positive spin that, that you guys are putting on it with all the social emotional work um, that you're embedding into the curriculum, but I guess that's just sort of a reflection point on some of the challenges that kids are experiencing these days that maybe we didn't have to deal with when we were growing up. But anyway, I'm glad to hear that, that you're putting so much focus on the social and emotional piece. So I would like to kind of take off on that too, so that we talk about um, the mindfulness aspect. I did a three-day seminar in June on mindfulness and education, and it was an amazing thing to see. So if you guys kind of starting this year could bring that further into the district, I think we could really benefit from that. One of the reasons I did that was our program at the University of Minnesota has seen huge increase in the levels of anxiety in our students in, at the college level. And one of the reasons was to kind of get in there and see what kind of opportunities we have to help decrease that anxiety when, and yet maintain the high expectations that we have of these students in our program, because we expect them to do well. We, it's a lot of work, and we don't want to be the cause of the anxiety, but you want to figure out ways to kind of help them succeed without overwhelming them. So. I would love to see kind of a continuation of that. The whole time I was at that seminar for work, I was thinking how great this would be for Ridgefield Public Schools to get something like this started in our program. So the fact that you've already done that with, with the PBIS and potentially we could head that way with the mindfulness aspect would be really great. And I do think uh, Mr. Yanowski, Ms. Kinowski alluded to this already, but just the opportunity or the fact that we can use um, summer school as an opportunity to do things like <coughs> mindfulness, like PBIS, like all of these things. So it's a huge um, benefit to our schools, it's a huge benefit to our kids. And yes, the mindfulness strategies, if you would have walked into one of our summer school classes with a group of 26th graders talking about ways that they relieve stress 
or ways that they can breathe deeply or walking in and you see 26 graders sitting around a circle with their eyes closed taking deep breaths in and then breathing out it was just it was a very powerful powerful reminder to us about all of the proactive things that we can do not only as kids but also as adults as well so in you have some data on you know math and reading, but I didn't see anything on the social emotional aspect of that. Do you are you collecting data on the potential effects of that? We have the social emotional data that we have was um, survey data from our students to determine whether or not they felt like they had learned anything. Our students said that they had learned a lot. We're tr still trying to figure out the best way to actually quantify that to say anecdotally, yes, our kids are saying they learned strategies. How now do we quantify that to say, are we seeing it in our academic scores? Are we seeing it on in our uh, referral rates? Things of that nature. There are a couple of ways we do track. Um, and sort of that indirect, one has to do with behavior referral rates, but also when you look at attendance and enrollment, um, summer school is obviously completely optional to students. Um, they're able to check out if they're not enjoying the opportunity. Um, and so with the social emotional component, the experiential learning, and looking at transforming the ways our classrooms look, um, you see increases in the students at basically every grade level, and that's a lot of the work that this team has put in. So I like the connection of the summer to the regular school year. Um, do you, I know I've asked about this last year when we talked about the, um, uh, the work that they did in summer school, but is there a connection of the PLCs from summer to summer, the work that they do, or from summer into, into the fall? So the PLCs um, during the summer, we use the same de data cycle procedure that we use during the school year. Um, and that's uh, actually, that did evolve since last year. Um, last year when we got to summer school, uh, different teachers had experienced different types of PLCs and different ways to do a data cycle. Um, and at, last summer, we kind of uniformed that when we brought all the schools together and we practice the same data cycle. Um, and so what I heard this school year, um, I heard many teachers say, we, we use the summer school. The, we use the way we did it in summer school now. Um, and so this year, um, it was much more familiar and teachers were able to just get right into it. Um, and so I do think that the way that teachers have learned the data cycle has um, also become more uniform. I just had um, some questions about you know, you mentioned the, the, the goal to maybe increase staff and, and others, but it, and the program seems to be growing, so what, is our, what, is our, what are our marketing efforts? Do we have a target student, or are all students, um, you know, from, from, our, from within our system, um, ideal candidates to participate? Do we have um, enrichment opportunities for really everyone across the, the whole spectrum? Are they commingled, um, you know, and, and you know, how do we measure, you know, I guess long term, how do we measure the success of it? It sounds to me like there are some new things this, this summer that we tried and, and you've mentioned some of the things to maybe track in the future. Um, you know, but we, it would be nice to see some historical data, for example, you know, just the number who participated year over year over year. You know, this year seems higher than, than prior years, so um, is this a high water mark or is this, you know, just getting us back to where we were four years ago? I don't know. So. Um, targeted services, um, in order to get funding for targeted services from the state, we are required to enroll students that meet the graduation incentives. Um, and there's a list of those, um, which we don't have with us, but some of the, qual uh, some of the eligibility requirements might be um, English as a second language, um, free reduced lunch, things like that. Okay. So those, homeless, highly, homeless, highly mobile. mobile. Okay. So there's like 12 different characteristics. So that's how students are eligible for the funding that we use during summer school. It's classroom teachers um, as well as social workers can refer students to summer school. The long term data though is something we can get more of I was also thinking about the, tran the transfer of information from summer to fall and other people have already raised PLCs and PBIS and all of the acronyms. Um, the last one I was wondering about uh, the individualized learning plan and whether that information is shared with fall teachers to give them a sense of, you know, what students achieved and, you know, where they are coming out of the summer that they can build on in their work with them starting today. 
That's actually something that we don't currently do. We, we get information from classroom teachers, um, spring data to use for the summer, um, but that's something that we can definitely look into is providing that summer school data for teachers in the fall. And I don't want you all to do it just because I brought it up. <laughs> if it feels like it would be useful and of value to kids and teachers, you know, I just think it would be interesting to hear more about it's, it. It's definitely been a conversation we've had. We've just not had a protocol for how to go about it, but it's something that I think would be valuable that we would look into for sure. Thank you guys very much. Thank you. Thank you. All right, so thank you to our summer school team. So as you can see, we have a very thriving and expanding summer school program, um, leading to obviously some of the goals we want to achieve during the school year. Um, goals we try to achieve during our school year are laid out in both our strategic plan um, and a significant amount of the work that I do as a superintendent in relation to my goals. Um, as we've talked about as our previous meeting, um, this is the time of year where we outline my draft goals for you all to give some feedback on prior to finalization. Um, we also provide an update of some of the highlights of our strategic plan, some of the major things that we've been working on and accomplishing, and then also some of those significant next steps. Um, so from a highlights perspective, and this is a quick overview, so I'm not going to go through this because a lot of these details are actually within each strategy. And how we try to organize our strategic plan um, is by each of the four strategies, and we have some pretty significant accomplishments to be proud of. Strategy one, um, just as a reminder, is we'll provide challenging, relevant, and engaging educational opportunities for all students that will also increase learning. So really focusing on having a very strong academic-based program um, and strong opportunities for our kids, but also looking at that outcome component, that thing that we talk about so much. Um, in this past year, some of our big highlights. Uh, building the seven period day at the high school, which obviously did launch today, um, including adding 20 minutes to our academic day, um, going to an A-B schedule, which provides additional opportunities for our students um, for seminars and supports during the course of the school day, um, which allows us to build an early college model, which started at ninth grade, which includes all students in ninth grade taking an AP human geography course and getting all of our students engaged at those most high rigorous levels early on in their academic careers. Also, one of the other highlights I want to touch on is really creating the Richfield Early Childhood Program. So as you all recall, um, we planned throughout the course of last year to launch our own early childhood and community ed programs, and we are excited and at the successful launch of those this summer. And obviously, early childhood is our four-year-olds and pre-K students came into our schools this year. Uh, taking a look at some of those big next steps, and I'm going to walk through each of these just to make sure we're looking at some of the things we're really focusing on this year. Um, with the increase in work from the state, we really want to look at our counseling process and increase college and career guidance, making sure that our students are ready for those next steps in college and career, and that we're really proactively working our way through it. Um, really looking at our instruction and our high quality formative assessments, making sure that they drive instruction and our curriculum in each subject area, which has led to us looking at a K-12 alignment in science and social studies, and also really looking at our current curriculum and really looking for relevant resources and continuing to expand using our equity lens to create resources that mirror our students and include the absent narrative that's so frequently not present in curriculum. Um, looking at a tiered system of supports, making sure that our academic supports are also there for social emotional needs as we begin training in Envoy and in classroom across our district, making sure that we're educating and supporting the whole child. And then this coming summer, we'll be looking at a pre-K summer school program launch to make sure that our students are prepared for school um, even at those earliest ages. And so those are some of the highlighted steps of the things we're going to be doing academically in those next pieces. Do you want to go through each strategy before we ask questions, or do you want to stop after each one for questions? <laughs> well, since you just asked the question now, I'm going to say this would be a spectacular time. No, I time. just want to know what, what is going yeah. to be best what, for you. Whatever you prefer, Crystal. I'm good to go right now. If you want to go one strategy at a time, that makes a lot of sense. And I promise yes, I'm not going to have a ton of things, but um, I, I, to this first point about college and career guidance, I, I mean, a huge issue that we struggle with in Minnesota is the ratio of counselors to students. I believe this is still accurate that we are um, worst in the entire country in terms of the ratio of counselors to students. And so I'm mindful of that as we're talking about this and how to continue to provide more support that our students absolutely deserve. Um, if we are still only going to be able to provide, I think it's what, three uh, counselors at the high school. So I would just 
you don't need to go into detail here, but that's on my mind and I would love to hear how that uh, intersects with the next steps you're thinking about. So one of the things we talk about is before we look at some of the ratio components or some of those external things we can't control, we really need to focus on the things we can control. And so what we've talked about at the high school is moving from what we call a reactive counseling model to a proactive counseling model. Um, our current structure and the typical counseling structure is set up to respond when students come to you. Mm -hmm. um, that's a more reactive model. Um, over the course of this year, we're moving towards a proactive model where our counselors are expected and working to reach out to students. Um, and so once we recreate that model where our counselors are more active going towards students rather than waiting for students coming to them, we'll get a better understanding of what a ratio and what an effective ratio of what we can serve. But we'll also allow our counselors to know each of their students more effectively and really deepen and improve that counseling model. Um, given that, I'll just share that the general recommendation is about 1 to 250, give or take, and we are at about 1 to 375. Um, so obviously we are not quite at the ratio that is the ideal or recommended, um, but we are certainly having three counselors within our high school, and so that, that does obviously provide some challenges. Okay, thank you. So I would just ask, um, you talked about the early college program at the high school, and um, one of the other things in strategy one like 1C and 1D talks about um, promoting or kind of shifting the mindset so that we also are always recognizing workplace certification and career readiness opportunities. So at some point I'd like to hear kind of what, it doesn't have to be right now either, but I'd be interested in hearing more about what we offer specifically in that area, kind of evidence that we are changing that mindset. Absolutely, and so I would just remind that we can definitely, when the high school comes to present that conversation, um, early college is about giving students opportunity um, to gain college credits within the high school, and we often think of college um, as a four-year experience. Um, some of our main college partnerships with early college are Normandale, Normandale Community College, who offers a multitude of technical-based courses in addition to academic um, classroom-based courses. Um, and similarly, we have a partnership with Hennepin Technical College, and a significant number of students are supported in taking classes through that partnership at Hennepin Tech. Other questions on strategy one? So strategy two is positively promoting Richfield Public Schools. And in this past year, we obviously migrated to an entirely new web platform. And while there are some bugs, obviously, we are very pleased with the overall technology and those technology steps. Um, we've expanded to multi-language signage throughout and across our district. Um, I really did a um, communications audit and implemented a significant number of those recommendations and are continuing to plan for ongoing community improvements through our surveys and our feedback data and responding to our constituents. And those are some of the significant highlights of our previous year. Um, looking at this year, um, really going into that website and continuing to improve the information there, improve the usability, and now that we are finding some of the tools of that accessible website, making it as accessible as possible. Um, obviously, we have a pretty significant levy referendum, um, and we have a role, a duty, and an obligation to share information around that. Um, and then as far as community um, partnerships, really using our communication to expand and deepen those partnerships. So if you look at Best Buy in that video that we saw, uh, they were there helping to hand out Chromebooks to students. We'll be meeting with them in terms of the digital promise, and we'll be looking at how to use our communication and marketing work to really leverage that relationship in a more effective way and expand those partnerships. Um, and then also just continuing to focus overall on improving communications and building systems throughout our organization. Strategy two, questions or comments? Uh, just a comment. Um, obviously the website probably is the <coughs> portal through which most people would be accessing information about the district. Um, and I'm sure you're already doing this, but just commenting that we, as we are leveraging, improving the uh, website as a tool for communication, that we are taking learnings from that medium and implementing it in other other communication strategies. You know, that whether it be written or verbal based or you know whatever sort of strategy that is, and um, and then being being cognizant that uh, about, I guess, what I would call the nonverbal parts of communication. Um, the words are important, but uh, equally important is the um, attitudes and, and tones and whatnot. And I know this is a big piece that you're, that you're working on, but uh, yeah, I feel that that's an important piece of that strategy as well. 
Absolutely. I think one of the, you know, certain times things blend together in an odd yet effective way. One of the really interesting things about Envoy strategies is they are extremely nonverbal. And so it's teaching uh, teachers how to interact with students in a nonverbal based way. Um, we have been looking at things like Innocent Classroom, even for our bus drivers. And we are looking at uh, strategies to talk about Envoy that aren't just about interacting with students, but how do you interact authentically and effectively with parents and, co and constituents and community members. Um, we had some pretty significant um, uh, community service-based training for many of our frontline folk last year, and we're going to continue on down that road to make sure that we're presenting the most positive and effective communications image, both verbally, non-verbally, and in written format, um, to make sure those are aligned and effective. So thank you. Um, strategy three, providing a welcoming, healthy, supportive, safe, and caring environment. And so looking at some of the results of the past year, um, we actually, if you recall, last fall completed a comprehensive review of our safety preparedness and our crisis intervention plan. Um, just last year was when we created and launched RCEP, and so that was uh, providing some extended opportunities. Um, we did a full uh, transportation safety review and established some additional district processes, expanding the after-school snack program. Um, some of the anxiety-reducing pieces have to do with transition events that we've really done to support new students and things like expanding our Spartan time and then also really over, overhauling our enrollment system to make sure that we are being most welcoming with our paperwork and in that first step within the Richfield Public Schools. Um, next steps for us is really looking to actively engage students and families from different cultures. As we look at um, you know, one of our policies later today, how do we engage families in our advisories and how do we make sure that people are widely represented on our PTOs um, and not just a traditional set of families but all of our families. I'm really looking to partner with Reimagine Minnesota, and they were part of our, our opening um, to really uh, reinforce our commitment to equity and excellence and really making sure that each student gets a voice and is encouraged systemically to share that voice with us. Um, continuing to expand training in Innocent Classroom, we're making sure that we try to train up to half of our staff this year with the other half being available for next year. Um, and then really continuing to systematize pieces, and we've worked on evaluation, we've worked on instruction and curriculum, and we're going to continue those pieces, but really looking for district and school-wide behavior programs that really teach, model, and reinforce our core values and to create that systemically across the organization. Questions or comments on strategy three? All right, and then four, acquiring and aligning human financial operation and technology resources to maximize organizational goals. Um, obviously, across our entire organization, we've implemented a rigorous selection process, um, both actively recruiting, but then also working to retain our highest quality staff. Um, in this past year, we completed a comprehensive facility studies and established processes for inspection. Um, developed a district staffing and budget process, making sure that we fully align resources with our needs and the things that are our top priorities. We're really continuing to look at and refine our budgeting and our projection-based process, um, and then have expanded evaluations to move from teachers to also paraeducators, and then creating evaluations for everyone across our entire organization. Um, and so, in this next year, as we look at those next steps, we're really going to continue to pursue opportunities to attract a more diverse workforce and make sure that our um, Staff-based data continues to further represent our students, um, ensuring that every staff member, and as we continue to roll out evaluations, that every staff member has performance feedback and evaluations, making sure that we all participate in professional growth opportunities. Um, we're going to continue to conduct a detailed review into our expenditures and our associated program outcomes to make sure that our outcomes are matching the money that we put in, um, and then also continuing to seek out an, um, quality professional learning opportunities, training teachers and staff, and strong cultural awareness, because that is one of the things that people report uh, looking for in the work environment. I do have two things on <coughs> strategy four. One, I think a very big result was not included on here, which is the improved financial rating for us as a district, that <laughs> I think is a very impressive result from last year, and we need to make sure that we keep talking about that, because that has such a long-term financial impact on us as a district. Uh, and then the second thing on the next steps, again, not, not for tonight, but for another time, I think that first bullet around attracting a more diverse workforce is critical and it is something that every district and school is trying to do and is deeply struggling to do well. And so I think what are we actually doing and what are we doing that is significantly different? 
I think is really important and is something I'm really passionate about. So just wanted to say that. All right. And as we have talked about as a board and we've had the reports previously, we have areas where we've been pretty significantly successful. Um, our overall leadership team has moved from around 10% uh, diversity to about 30%. Um, our teacher uh, workforce has moved, I believe, from around 6% to around 8%. And so while that's a small uptick, it's actually above the state average. Um, and we're really looking at ways to really go out and aggressively cr recruit and create um, the most talented possible workforce that we can find. That, that gets to my question, <coughs> and maybe you've already got this. Um, but essentially, I was thinking about uh, reporting, monitoring, essentially measuring metrics of progress. Um, wondering how much uh, with strategy four um, over the short term we'd be looking at process oriented metrics um, as opposed to actual outcomes like you know the percentage of diversity within our staff um, and then also wondering about I mean the diversity I feel is a one piece that we can be pretty objective about how we're measuring that. Um, the recruiting and retaining, I'm um, just curious to know what sorts of metrics you guys would be thinking about to help us monitor our success in that area. Um, and I engage with board member Paulus in conversation about our recruitment. Um, recruitment of diversity is complex um, because um, people don't necessarily identify um, that type of data and that type of data would be completely confidential at that point point. Um, and then staff may or may not identify um, their Diversity when they enter the organization. So there is obviously some significant complexity to that um, in terms of retention of staff obviously mr. Holgey and the team in HR can Look at our retention of staff and talk about what our longevity of staff is and and how we're doing in terms of transitioning staff um, within the organization and retaining staff within the organization. And so there is data kept on that. And we can certainly have a report back to the board in that relation. Um, and I think you're right. I think process is one of those areas. And board member Brackey pointed this out, is this is something that every district is working on and colleges are working aggressively towards. Um, in our history over the past several years, we've participated in Grow Your Own programs. We've participated in partnerships with private and public colleges. Um, we've worked to aggressively recruit student teachers and people early in their careers, we've gone to job fairs that are known for producing higher diversity in terms of their candidates, um, and will continue to do so. Um, and we've come up with a 2% give or take uptick in our staff of color. Um, and so as we look at that, we also need to think about, um, and what we're finding through our experiences, there's areas that are more successful. Some colleges are turning out a higher percentage of high quality teachers of color than others. Um, and so we've worked to expand and deepen our partnerships there and expand our student teacher partnerships there. Um, and we're looking at different ways to recruit than have happened in the past so that we can see more than a one, 2% uptick. Um, Cause as we've talked about at the board, um, incremental progress is lovely, um, but we would like to set higher bars for ourselves and we'd like to try to do uh, more effective recruitment if possible. And I think that one of the, one of the challenges um, with the metric, at least what I had was thinking in my head, is that um, it may not, because we're talking about recruiting and retaining a high quality staff, um, and it may not be the case every given year that seeing an, an, an improved retention rate means higher quality, necessarily. I mean, you know, this is, this is all dependent upon what's the pool of folks that you're working with in any given time. So I guess I just want to put that out there as, as a, um, a, a way of acknowledging that the metric is difficult and not one-dimensional. Agreed. I think the key metric, regardless of any other metric, is high quality. Um, because I think what we are all looking for is the best possible teachers and the best possible staff in front of our children. Um, and that would be the a number one component in anything that we're doing, um, regardless of any of the other components. And then there are a wider variety of pieces of things we want to attract and retain to our organization. Any other questions about strategic plan update? All right, so one of the pieces as we analyze my overall performance is looking at goals, um, those types of things for which I will be judged upon um, over the course of this year and the things I'll set out to accomplish. And this is a presentation of draft goals, which will be refined um, prior to making them the goals that we'll talk about repeatedly. 
Um, just as a reminder for the performance formula, it looks at 35% student achievement, 35% uh, process goals, and then 30% individual performance. Um, each of these goals um, will align directly to the work that we're doing, obviously, within the organization, and so that my performance is judged overall based on how we're doing as an organization. So it breaks down into, from a draft perspective, three achievement goals, um, eight uh, process goals coming straight out of our strategic plan, um, and then four personal evaluation-based goals, um, which obviously come into my final summary evaluation um, in early summer, and we'll do a quarterly review of these as we also talk about how we're doing on the strategic plan. Um, obviously, we want to continue our progress on the graduation rate. We were highly successful in that area, um, looking for continued growth. We had a 5.5% jump last year, looking to continue to jump by at least 3% or more and continuing that growth until we get to at least 90%, um, which is the um, both No Child Left Behind or the ESSA Act um, and what, what we're looking for as a state. Um, and you'll see a re uh, refining of our work in regard to the MCA3 work um, in terms of continuing to o increase overall math proficiencies. Um, but as we work through our school improvement plans and we really look at uh, delving further into our data, um, we're noticing that there is obviously a gap, and we're widely aware of this, between our highest and our lowest achieving students. So what we want to see in math and in reading is growth in the overall proficiency rate, but we also want to see a reduction in the gap between our highest and our lowest achieving students. Um, thereby targeting equity in all of our students by raising achievement for all while accelerating achievement for some of our lowest achieving students. Questions about that? I don't entirely know if it's a question or a comment, so do, do with it what you will. Um, I, I think the, uh, I agree with the, the two bottom goals about the overall proficiency, but as I was reading this in advance of the meeting, I was also thinking about if we just look at overall proficiency, it can mask real differences at individual school sites. Mm -hmm. um, and so the extent to which we can be talking about overall while still paying attention to the individual schools and what is happening there feels important to me. Yes, I would, I would agree. And so while I am, and so just as a reminder, I'm judged based on the performance of all six of our schools, and my evaluation is directly tied to that. Um, we absolutely present that data um, building by building to our board and to our community. Um, and um, obviously for me, for, for a principal, it is within their building. For me, it is within all of our buildings. So acknowledged completely. very difficult if not impossible to answer. Um, is it possible for us to put a quantitative stake in the ground in terms of our proficiency goals? We, we asked that last year. Yeah. Right? I think we did. And I, and I think, yeah. So at any rate, I, I'm going to ask the question. Again. again <laughs> uh, mm -hmm. Mainly just for the sake of discussion. I, like I said, I'm not sure if there's a right Is it? Possible, yes. Um, you know, the state basically sets specific targets, theoretically. Um, the, the challenge with putting a stake in the ground is it tends to be arbitrary. Um, and so the state has decided that 100% of our students will be proficient by a certain date, and so then we receive goals that make it there in a certain number of years. Um, so we certainly can do that. Um, but the challenge of doing that is it, it becomes one of those arbitrary pieces, and so we're just sort of picking a number based on any obvious number of rational theories or state-based theories, but, but they don't tend to have, have enough rational statistical background to, be, to make a whole lot of sense. Let me just make an advocacy point. Um, the advocacy point being that um, by giving ourselves a target, um, setting the bar, right? Correct. Uh, it, it's just a little bit more about um, Trying, trying to set a target that is both attainable and a stretch. You know, this whole notion that um, we know we know we're aiming towards um, significant improvement, um, and then it's a question of well, how much improvement is significant? Um, so, just something to chew on would be the thought of, and again, I, I know the other challenge here is that the. Uh, the measurement changes. Uh, you know, we've had MCA3 for how many years now? Um, I think about four years, but it's also important to note that the MCA3 is different every year. Um, and so the test may function 
harder from year to year or easier from year to year, which makes it obviously a complex component. Um, so if you look at, for example, the entire state um, theoretically went down in math. Is that a function of math achievement going down or is that a function of a more difficult test? And there really isn't a statistical analysis that tells us that. Um, and so that, that's where it becomes obviously a challenge. And so looking at our growth in context is also one of those pieces. Um, obviously, we tend to shoot for informally three to five point gains or higher. Um, but then we also have to put that in context of what does the state, what, what happened in the state. Um, well, would, would it be fair then to say that one of our achievement goals should be improvement for uh, proficiency overall, reducing the gap, and also improving our standing relative to the state average? Wouldn't that accomplish some of what you just suggested? That we that, could have that, that you know, for example, if, if if this was a year in which the the math score statewide was down, and what does that really signal? Mm -hmm. It's hard it's hard to pinpoint. But if we did not decrease or actually increase while the state decreased, would would that not be something that was that is signal uh, signaled perhaps some improvement? We could absolutely do that. Um, we could do this in a number of ways. Um, and and again, this is a great great place for input. You know, the Achievement and Integration Plan shares it in a similar type of way, talking about achievement gains and puts targets for all, um, and then puts targets by each group of students. Um, we can also look at, you know, it, it again, it, it's very difficult to quantify. Um, from, from my perspective, right. we absolutely could throw that in, or anything else? That, that people would like to look I guess one concern I have without any actual stated goals other than improvement is that it's possible to see trace improvement and do we, do we really want to say at the end that we're we're satisfied with that if it's point point one percent would that I mean it's improvement but is it is it adequate improvement would we want it to be measured by percent score or, or score on the test or count it as for example, um, number of students who scored higher than, than previously. You know, if we, is, what is a meaningful number of our students who perhaps previously are not scoring above this, this mm -hmm. threshold, whatever it is, and now we have, whether it's 5, 10, 50, or 100 of them who are higher than, again, a, a right. threshold that moves and may or may not necessarily be the lone indicator of, of, of anything meaningful. Right. We could take, um, and I'll give some more examples, we could take a bunch of different options. The mean score increasing for our students, um, meaning not the number of proficient students, but students growing in terms of what they were previous year. Um, we can, again, we can talk about the students moving from not proficient to partially proficient, the number and percentage of students moving from partially to fully proficient. There's, there's really a, or we could use the MMR rating from the state. Um, there's a bunch of different ways to look at it. I would argue, and we all can disagree, I would argue that any growth beyond um, static is actually significantly positive. It may not be where we want to go, um, but if a year's progress is a base growth and more students than, and you have an increased number of students making a year's progress than you had had previously, then you gained some ground compared to um, basically remaining static or moving backwards. Um, now, is that where we want to go? Is that our ultimate goal? No, we obviously want to accelerate achievement for all of our students. Um, but at the very least, we want to make a year's progress or more um, based on our average overall, overall work. Absolutely, and I'm, again, people can, we have plenty of time to play with this. If, if there are brilliant thoughts from any board members, I'm completely open to whatever transformational pieces or ideas around ways to look at our statistics, ways to look at our data. Um, one thing we haven't touched on is MMR, and it's a very complex-based calculation that's nearly impossible to understand, but it tries to do all of those pieces. Um, and so we, we could, again, we could look at student achievement in a multitude of different ways, and, and I'm fully open to board guidance on that. Try to spend some time thinking about is what would represent real progress and then thinking about how to articulate that within the flawed and limited construct of standardized test scores i think we all know that that is imperfect and that that in and of itself does not represent student learning but within that construct what would represent real progress and and while i agree that you know one year's growth is 
uh, is good and is what we should expect. I think the reality is for our students who are several years behind grade level, actually one year is not enough. Um, and so that's what I feel like I just need to spend some time thinking more about, because as you said, right. there are so many ways to do this. None of them are perfect, <laughs> and it's complicated. Yeah. Right. I think, and, and at least traditionally, we've, uh, we've had NWEA um, mm -hmm. measures of, of growth that I believe are standardized in that way to some extent where you can Yes, we have that work, and they also work on that with the MCA also. Um, one thing to point out that just measuring proficiency rates, and so what I was talking about was proficiency rates specifically, so increasing the number of proficient students. Students who are two years and three years behind, um, they aren't measured in the proficiency rate. You can make um, two, and a, if you're two years behind and you make two and a half years growth, you're still going to come up not proficient because the bar went up one year. Um, and so the current state-based proficiency piece doesn't do a lot in terms of measuring achievement growth for our students who are significantly behind. And so we also want to look at that as we think about what is growth overall. Mm -hmm. um, because the proficiency number meets, or really looks at students who are in and around that proficiency, and do you have more students who are above than were below before? But students who were, let's say, exceeding by two, three years aren't measured by that because they'll be the same in terms of meeting from year to year and may have gone backwards. Um, and students who are significantly behind could have had an extremely positive growth-based year, and they're not really necessarily reported on in that proficiency rate either. So it's definitely something for us to give thought to. Or perhaps Mr. Paulus to put his actuarial <laughs> mind behind and, and solve this for, for solve all this of us. Solve this for the entire state of Minnesota <laughs> and perhaps right. the country. Not just our district. All right, so something for you all to think about, something for us to talk about. Um, and again, we have the opportunity and can absolutely refine those throughout the course of this year. Um, strategic plan process goals, some of those th big things that we really want to accomplish and will be a main focus of my work. Um, obviously, we have new start times in our schools, and we have a seven-period day at our high school. Today, obviously, we launched um, 8.30 start time for our secondary schools, which has now been outlined in multiple papers and across the country as being significant for adolescents, their health, their mental health, and their academic-based health. Um, and so making that be a smooth and effective transition will be some of those process goals that I work on. Um, obviously, effective referendum communication. We have a, an operational levy and a capital levy, making sure that we dot every I, cross every T, and also effectively fulfill our obligation of openly communicating the importance of the communications component of our referendum. Um, systemically supporting, obviously, our new leadership and our team at STEM. We had a pretty significant transition of leadership and of staff at STEM, um, with obviously a new principal assistant principal. We actually have a new lead secretary, new social worker, a new gifted and talented, um, and new media specialist. So a lot of those larger positions at STEM are new, and so we want to make sure that that's a smooth transition. We have a highly successful year at STEM, and so we've put some things in place there. Um, and I'll be working on that throughout the course of this year. I'm continuing to expand our staff evaluation efforts. We're trying to get our staff evaluation to most of, if not all of our staff, to make sure that all of our staff, licensed or non-licensed, um, are having fair and effective feedback and evaluation. Um, our equity rollout and our expansion, um, talking about the process of innocent classroom throughout the district, and also reimagine Minnesota and doing some of that work for student voice at our high school and then throughout our organization. Continuing the curriculum review and alignment, and this is a three year, as year two of our three year work, really looking to make sure that we have aligned curriculum throughout our organization and it really begins to represent our students and some of those unheard voices. Um, and then really um, continuing with our budget work and the transparency to make sure that at each building we have a process to walk through them at the building in the spring, um, make sure that we have transparency and communication going out to our staff and to our families. Um, to talk about how do we budget, what does this mean from a school-to-school -school perspective, and what is that process? I do, uh, again, unclear if it's a question or a comment, but I, uh, as I was reading through this, I just feel like uh, smooth. H how do we know? How do we know if that actually happened or not? And in whose eyes, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so I, I think just thinking about these process goals and how we actually measure and whose opinions on whether things were smooth, effective, et cetera, are going to be important as mm -hmm. we just continue through the year on this. Absolutely. Um, and then my personal goals. Um, and so as we talk about my evaluation, um, the areas that I'm going to specifically focus on um, to try to continue being the best possible superintendent that I can be, um, really expanding and deepening those Richfield relationships, really looking to partner with each of our schools, our staff, and throughout the organization. 
um, to make sure that as we work with our students to systematize strong and positive relationships, um, that I also model and lead the way doing that throughout our organization. Um, really looking at continuing to expand and increase our leadership attendance and participation um, at extracurricular activities across the district, uh, sporting events, Penn Fest, um, just continuing to increase that leadership presence, um, attendance, and engagement um, throughout, throughout the system. Um, launching, you know, prior to me coming, we had a staff and parent advisory council. Um, I've continued some of that work through Ed Richfield, but as we've continued to get in, um, additional feedback, um, looking at a systemic launch of, um, it used to be the SPAC and the STAC, um, Superintendent Parent and Superintendent Teacher Advisory Committees. Um, looking at gathering, figuring out a systemic way to gather and increase voice. Um, and so as we think about that engagement piece, um, one of my roles in that will be to create a systemic engagement plan for staff and also for community members uh, with a direct line to me. Um, and then also working to align um, systemically our engagement efforts throughout the entire organization through all levels. So as you think about board engagement with our community, staff engagement with our community, and how do we also engage with our students, how do we do that systemically and create expectations and plans um, that are also transparent and communicated throughout our entire organization. Um, and for, again, for me to lead and model through uh, parent advisory councils, but also for me to lead and model as the superintendent. I just want, uh, I just want to comment on um, the uh, relaunch of the staff and the parent advisory council, um, you know, just the impact on the board. I, I was previously the liaison to the um, parent advisory council, so I imagine that will be kicking off again. <laughs> Um, you know, we'll have a, and I don't know if there was someone for the staff advisory council. There was not. Okay. So what I've done is I've talked to our uh, communications consultant, Christine Robleski, talking about a systemic way to create a uh, broad-based voice. Mm -hmm. um, since um, it, one of the questions we would have to talk about as we create that process is whether that is something for board members to be a participant in or whether it's not. Um, Part of the goal is for us to have um, system-wide engagement opportunities for parents, particularly those who are underrepresented or who don't necessarily have a voice, uh, but also make sure that that happens across the organization. Um, and so as we reflect on that, um, thinking about whether that does mean is there a board representative to participate and hear those same pieces, or is that something we want to make sure that we have voice from across the organization and board members obviously have access to the superintendent on almost any time that they would prefer, um, and so what is the role in terms of board members in regard to that piece? Um, it, it may just be one of, of title or, or, you know, do we, we have other advisory committees and advisory councils and there seems to be a, a board representative on nearly all of them, so. Absolutely. So, so definitely yeah. a process to think through. Yeah. Other questions, comments, or thoughts? Um, regarding expanded and even richer relationships, my concern still is how can we increase market share families living in Richmond. We're losing one out of four about to be a private or a charter or neighboring district. And I would like to see if somehow get some of those people in Richmond. Okay, so as one of our process goals, or as I look at that, we should be looking at either a measurement related to market share um, or specifically um, redefining one of the goals around um, marketing and engagement to increase our market share and to, to support an enrollment, so a set of enrollment work. We very commonly had enrollment-based goals um, <coughs> and market share-based goals. That's been a common thing we've done before. So we absolutely can look at that. Other comments or feedback at this time? So I will take that under advisement um, and I will do some revisions and come back with um, some ideas. If you all can think about a couple ideas around the achievement piece um, and we will take some next steps in revising goals to make those finalized. Commendations. Commendations on page 65 of the board packet. Um, we had three very exciting commendations. Um, one is uh, congratulations to board member Tim Paulus um, for completing the Minnesota School Boards Association Leadership Workshop, se Workshop Series, phase one, two, and three. And I have a spectacular certificate from the Minnesota School Board Association to present to Mr. Paulus today. Thank you. Thank you.
We would I'd like, like to, to commend I'd like to Mr. thank Powell. the Academy. <laughs> So well done, and many of our board members have completed multiple trainings, um, and so from time to time, MSBA uh, sends, sends certificates out to us to congratulate team members. Uh, second one, Richfield High School German teacher, Elizabeth Zenfenning, um, on page 66, you'll see a letter, uh, received a letter of gratitude from the Consulate General of the Federal Republic of Germany, uh, Herbert Quell, expressing his gratitude for our partnership in the German-American Partnership Program, um, along with an invitation for Richfield students to visit his office in Chicago. Um, we have a significant number of German students uh, visiting us at this time, um, and they are partnering with families within Richfield, and we have a very thriving uh, high school German program. So congratulations and thank you to Ms. Zen Fenning. Um, and then a late addition to the board packet. Um, we also have a letter we received about uh, Ken Friel, and of course I just closed the packet on myself accidentally. Uh, Mr. Friel has been accepted and received a Fulbright scholarship. Hang on. Um, he is one of 35 U.S. student uh, citizens uh, chosen to travel abroad to uh, be a Fulbright Distinguished Award teacher um, in Columbia, South America. Fulbright uh, grants are selected on the basis of academic and professional achievement as well as demonstrated leadership potential. And Mr. Friel is a teacher at RDLS. Uh, Mr. Friel responded saying, I believe my uh, selection was strongly influenced by our district's commitment to closing the achievement gap and supporting teachers and strengthening cultural competency. So we're very proud of Mr. Friel. Um, we're excited to have him go out to the world and represent our district. Well done, team members. Have a nice year. He's going to do some like Skyping back with students and stuff at, at RDLS. It sounds like it's going to be pretty cool. Absolutely, absolutely. So as he asked for my support, one of the only ways you are able to actually fully engage is to receive support from the district um, in taking a leave. Um, and so rather than just saying yes, of course, knowing me as you all do, I said, so how will you bring that back to our students and to our staff to share that? Um, he's also agreed to do some professional development and some work with staff once he does return. Um, but yes, he absolutely plans on doing some communication and check-in with our students and with our staff while he is abroad. Um, with his Fulbright Scholarship, which I believe will happen um, in midwinter this coming year. Based on anxiety. Yes. <laughs> yes. yes. That would be really nice for okay. I would love to. Can you take us with us? Yeah. 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 Can we change Colombia to Colombia? Yeah. Ah. <laughs> Got it. We will absolutely do that. I know it was last minute. Yeah. Um, and I think it would be wonderful to have him come share with us as a board as well yes. as the work he's doing with absolutely. staff and students. Absolutely. We will do that. Okay, so now we can move on to the consent agenda. Is there any discussion? I will move the consent agenda. And I will second the motion. So I have a motion by Ms. Brocky, a second by Mr. Tensing. Um, any further discussion? All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? The chair votes aye and the consent agenda is approved. We will move on to old business and board policy 206. All right, so as we come back for the next read um, of our policy, public participation in school board meetings, you will notice a new set of changes um, based on the wording we have talked about. And as a reminder, we have board policy 203 sitting out there in the world waiting for us to finish this, and we will finish up 203, the organization of board, at the same time. And so just to look at the changes, um, one purpose um, and we were trying to clarify the difference between open forum discussion and just really trying to create clarity around that. Um, and so our goal is to create opportunity for public to suggest agenda items um, and then also to assure opportunity for public comment while protecting the rights to due process. Um, general state of policy, and we've changed the word discussion to engagement because we do want to have public engagement in our work, um, but obviously as a board we don't um, have public comment where we openly discuss um, those with with members um, and so board um, does have a public comment opportunity but there's also opportunity likely outside of the formal school board meeting because that doesn't necessarily provide time and again that's based on the feedback um, from our past meeting jumping down to section six procedures I'm um, looking at um, we've split it to public comment agenda items um, and then public comment complaints and then public comment general 
um, which sort of indicates trying to be clear about um, having an engagement opportunity in regard to what is in our, on our agenda, um, and then also having some specific different items, and we just sort of realign those pieces around what would we do if those wanted to come to the school board to complain. Um, and then the language that goes along with that. So I'll give you all a minute to just take a quick scan. So before we go on to that, I, I hand it out. Everybody has on their desk, and there's Beth has some if anybody else wants to take a look. But um, Portland Public Schools has a, a tool that um, Crystal and I received in our um, culturally responsive leadership training. Um, and it's just a set of questions to use when you make policy and review policy putting things at, through um, kind of a racial equity lens. So you ask this set of questions as you review your policies. I think um, we can use this one, basically that's from Portland Public Schools, or we can kind of maybe tweak it to be specific to Richfield if we would prefer. Um, and I think that it would be good when administration looks through these, um, these policies that we're consistently reviewing or writing a new policy that we ask all these questions as we write it and that as a board we look at them through these questions also. And so then, can I ask a question yeah. on that? So yeah. I just want to make sure I'm getting it for the notes and that I understand. So you're bringing to us a racial equity lens from Portland Public Schools and the suggestion is that as we look at our policies, we read the policy, we look at the MSBA policy, then we also utilize a set of questions from a racial equity perspective and use that system for each of our policy reviews to make sure that we are supporting all of our constituents correctly, is that? Exactly. Okay. And then the other sheet that you have is um, an example of a, a district equity dashboard. So this was another seminar I went to the next day and it's kind of a way to look at where you are by looking at some of the things we talked about, you know, in our, in our goals and our strategic plan about demographic index. So looking at the diversity of our students, our licensed staff, our leadership team, and our administration, and tracking that um, on a regular basis. So looking at all of these things, so that it goes from that to MCA scores based on diversity, behavior index, and then participation in extracurricular activities, things like that. So it's a way for us to kind of look and see how we actually are doing equity-wise, and we can tweak this to however we might like it for Richfield Public Schools but this was a tool that, um, that we got from MSBA. So as I think about this particular tool, and I'm seeing it for the first time, um, <laughs> I think back to the conversation we actually had around achievement. Um, and one of the things I could say to the board is, is that there are districts that utilize a dashboard, um, not just in achievement, but across a wide range of data points. Um, so it's not just confined to the MCA. Um, we could certainly look at um, judging my performance and our overall district performance um, based on a dashboard of data points, um, also utilizing, and it's something board members have asked for, which is a uh, disaggregated breakdown of our students um, by all of the diverse, um, all the diversity and the groups that they bring to our organization, um, and look, finding a systemic way to look at that. Um, and so this might be an option um, for us, either within the achievement component, but or, or as a larger organization, is to create a dashboard of, of looking at how are we performing from a data perspective um, across the spectrum of, of areas. Because I've also seen it applied. I think we talked about this at one point. I've seen it applied besides just in the in the equity world, but also as another way to look at how your district is performing overall, based on things that you are that you fi feel are important in your schools beyond test score data. Because it there's really a lot more to how well a district teaches their students and serves their students than um, than just test scores. So I think that's something that we had also talked about building. A, a separate kind of dashboard about how we are doing as Richfield Public Schools. Any other additions or thoughts? I, I, I have a question. The, the, I wasn't here for the discussion on it, and it, I, when I watched the video in fast speed, I didn't pick up on it. The, the inclusion on in, um, Section 2A, the phrase, the school board may adopt reasonable time, place, and manner restrictions on public expression. It used to say just in, in order to facilitate free discussion by all interest, interested parties, but now we've included the language likely outside of the formal school board meeting time. I have the same question. And, and it, 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 meeting law. Well, it, well, there's that. I, there's that, but I, I don't. I don't see how we would adopt any restrictions that. Um, 
on public expression outside of the formal school meeting time. We, we can control this meeting. I get that. that and, but it reads wording. to me as if the, that we're trying to restrict how anyone can have, and, and it's just a wording thing. I don't think that was the intent. Yeah, the wording is obviously klutzy. Um, yeah. The goal is to remind people that we don't actually engage in a public comment back and forth, and so that discussion would have to happen, um, and that was some of the conversation would have to happen outside of the school board. Um, but that there are opportunities right. to engage school board members, um, and school board members are widely available for that. Can we add the open meeting law somehow to that when we have to move a discussion outside of this setting? Because then it wouldn't be recorded. And yeah. Right. And the implication wasn't that you all as a group would meet with somebody outside of here. This would be if somebody wanted to engage with a board member. Yes. Really Got it. Like, I know right. to us, yeah. it jumped if, right. if we know that. But right. So that would be some wording to go back to. Okay. So purpose area B, we'll need to reword. Um, and I think we were hoping to get it ideally at our next board meeting after this. I think this was number three or four, and we had thought one more after this. So this is the time to really pick. This is probably one where uh, the, concept, the concept that we're getting at maybe just doesn't fit in subheading A. Um, and we either need to create a new subheading or, or put it somewhere else. Subheading. So the, Give me the, two, idea, eh? the idea that there would be restrictions on right on, that we would be placing restrictions. Yes, we will. We'll yeah. take a look at that and figure out figure out how to express that that piece. I think the intention was to remind people that public comment isn't a back and forth engagement. Um, I think we can yeah. just say. I mean, we literally yeah. could say. Yeah. That. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Got it. And we'll we'll take care of that. What I was going to suggest, and this is this is a. Um, a, a step to a, an, another point, um, but what I was going to suggest is that when we get down into section six, yes, it is section six, that we um, that we go ahead and separate out um, the uh, the agenda items section, mm -hmm. the open forum section and whether the general comment section needs to be its own or whether that sort of flows into one of the others. I uh, guess at least that was, the, that was the concept in my mind mm -hmm. that we were really talking about um, several means that are available to the public mm -hmm. to engage with the board as a whole. Mm -hmm. um, and what means that individual chooses might be dependent upon what aims they're shooting for, mm -hmm. uh, but you know the idea that you would have a more formal process of of uh, being part of the agenda, um, and that because that's a more formal process, there are more expectations mm -hmm. around um, sort of the uh, appropriate content. Um, that's not necessarily a, a completely open. Um, uh, Forum in that setting, um, and that there would probably be more time, more more lead time necessary in order to allow for adequate preparation of if there's if materials are necessary, etc., um, to to really inform a um, a good robust discussion among uh, members of the public and and the board. Because I think that that was another piece from my perspective that. Um, there are times when it's appropriate just to listen, but there are also times when um, feedback is, is appropriate as well mm -hmm. and important um, in terms of maintaining that public trust. Um, so I guess that's how I was envisioning, that we would, have, we would have a more formal process, which would be sort of that agenda item process, the public comment being a much less formal and separate process um, that we would define. And that, that was where my, uh my confusion in that same section was coming in as well because I feel like uh, subsection two, you know, citizens who wish to address the school board on a particular subject should identify the subject in the agenda items. Mm. The way that I read that, I actually was thinking that means that they get to talk while we are on that agenda item. Mm. And then number three, actually, the very last sentence says, no, those comments occur during the public comment section. So I think we just need to be clearer about um, the process for requesting an item be discussed is one thing, and then 
sharing public comment with us is a separate thing, and then whether wanting to be part of the discussion with us, to your point, on an agenda item is potentially a third thing. And I think those distinctions are still not quite clear enough in okay. here. And I'm happy to do more work on this because I know it's hard to take these somewhat high level conversations that we're having here and actually translate it into text. Um, because I think the, the spirit of what we were talking about last time is reflected here. I think it's probably still just not clear enough to somebody who would be reading this without all the, the context that we have. Okay. I also think one of the things that we talked about when we were putting this together as a policy was the implementation and then the communication, yeah. the simpler communication that would perhaps go up on the website about communicating with the board. And I know, I know we're just mm -hmm. in the policy stage, but I think it would actually be helpful to kind of look at how we would present this to the public and how it would be um, kind of envisioned on the website and how we would set up that access. I think um, having some view of that might help pull this all together too. It might help everybody see it more simply if we can see how it's gonna be presented. Okay, um, that sounds like we should also work on then developing 206.1, the guideline. Um, when we had talked about that a couple mm -hmm. meetings back and the guideline would then out outline what do we do and how do we communicate this and how do we actually implement uh, public comment and agenda components in those pieces. So we will we will look at that as we take our next swing. Anything else? And again, I appreciate we're keep all the work it that's gone into it. Thank you. We're ready to move it forward. Yeah, and I, think, and I, I would yep. just echo Crystal's willingness to actually be in the weeds where it's nothing and if you think that would be helpful yep. uh, rather than trying to read our minds. <laughs> I will keep that in mind for yeah. board members Bracky and Tensing to <laughs> come and help. Um, and then lastly, Christine, I know you, you raised these uh, two mm -hmm. resources and I just wanted to say I'm really excited about them. Um, I think the questions on the lens from Portland Public Schools are really thoughtful and I think could help illuminate blind spots that we might have as a board and as a district. And then I'm really excited thinking about the way in which we could potentially take this dashboard and just connect it back to the conversation we were having about superintendent goals and how are we measuring success as a district. So I think both of these could be really, uh, really good and useful for us as a board and as a community. Okay, so we'll continue to work on board policy 206 and we move on to new business and the change order, order for Centennial Wall Repair. And Mr. Halji. Thank you. I have for your approval tonight a change order for $12,881 as part of the exterior wall repair at Centennial Elementary School. Um, this is a project that's been ongoing over the summer. Uh, there are a series of items that were included in this, um, all relatively small. Uh, one, it installs the aluminum angle for flashing back up with the steel columns. It restores masonry on the well house east of the school. Um, if you've been in most of our schools, you've noticed these well houses that are out in your parking lots. Uh, many of those have gone without repair but still need to be maintained and constructed that way. Um, it replaces partial lintel over penthouse doors um, and a partial lintel over the large mover on the west elevation and replaces some additional brick and ceiling beyond the original scope of that work. Um, it was a $245,000 project. This adds $12,881.97 for a total of $257,881.97 for that project. And that wraps the whole project up. Craig, I have a question. Okay. Um, on a lot of our projects like this, you, you okay. before we kick it off and before we get bids, you give us a, a high level estimate of what it might cost based on prior things. Do, do you recall what this one? Um, I don't recall the exact amount, but the bid came in lower with the $12,000 variance. It's relatively small and would have been underneath that original budget. Thanks. I would add, I had um, emailed Mr. Holgey yeah. earlier today <coughs> asking questions about some of the numbers on the RFI where it says administration $75 and markup 15%. And he explained that, um, that typically the actual cost of the supplies to do and the, the supplies and the labor are separated out in these now and then the cost of administration and markup. So that's basically what the company makes on it are separated out to be more transparent. So it was helpful for me to know that. 
Yeah, yeah. Um, and the last one we saw is overhead and profit. Um, other, this one includes the um, administration and markup, and so one component is their fixed operating expenses, including their facilities or clerical support or things like that. And then the other percent is what they consider their profit as part of that profit margin. Pictures with a thousand words on this one with, uh, <laughs> with the photos. It's like, what is a little? Uh, <laughs> they have definitely show areas yeah. that are in need of repair. So having said that, I will uh, move the change order as presented. I will second. So I have a motion by Mr. Tensing, a second by Mr. Ashmead. Uh, is there any further discussion? All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? The chair votes aye and the motion passes. Thank you. So we will move on to board policy first read. All right, so a couple policies tonight for first read, and they align to a lot of the conversation that we have been having. Um, transparent communication, um, and then looking at our work perhaps through an equity lens to see how we are engaging a wide range of our families. Uh, one, uh, board policy 926, public relations. And so as this is a first read, um, just looking at our policy um, in its original form, um, encouraging the board and each employee to pursue two-way communications programs, um, some of the things that we have been working on to make sure that we are having effective home, school, and community partnerships, um, and that we communicate effectively with our constituencies, um, including doing it in an on-time fashion um, and sharing things in um, an effective and proactive way. Um, one of the unique components of this policy that I that I noted that's quite interesting, um, which I don't think we're 100% in compliance with, um, is um, Section 4, Responsibility for Implementation, uh, Section B. Uh, superintendent is directed to uh, develop administrative guidelines to carry out the intent of this policy. And so while we have, um, we have definitely a set of procedures in place in our schools and we have some of those pieces. There actually is not an administrative guideline that I am aware of that follows this policy or there is not a uh, 926.1. Um, and so as we do sort of that second read, um, you can anticipate us coming back with a summary of some of the um, administrative guideline components to carry out the intent of effective proactive uh, two-way communication across our organization. Um, and again, that is in line with some of the goals that we're working on. Um, questions or initial thoughts? So did we look at MSBA model policy for any of this at this point? Um, we don't do that in the first read, um, but we will absolutely take that full look prior to bringing it back. So could you send that over to all of Yes. To look at it before also? Um, that's a good reminder. So one of the things that um, Chair Malik has asked um, our administrative team to do is, is that as we go through each policies prior to those second reads and the first pieces of revision, uh, we send out MSBA model policy to all the board members um, so that we are able to look at what are the best practices from the Minnesota School Boards Association. I just had two overarching reactions as I was reading this, and, and I think part of it could be rooted in the fact that this was adopted in 1999, and I think <laughs> language just changes, uh, especially around public relations and the social media world that we are currently in. The phrase um, public relations program just didn't seem quite right to me. It feels like this is actually more of a strategy. It's not a specific program. So that was just a language question that I had. And then um, the second thing is, as I was reading it, I was thinking a lot about language and about accessibility um, and the extent to which, uh, you know, language and having things be available and accessible to people in multiple language uh, feels to me to be a pretty key part of a public relations strategy or approach. So just wanted to share that. Yeah, that would be an example of um, procedures that we follow, um, things like translations and, and things of that nature that we should definitely put in within that guideline component um, and also would, would sort of pass that test as we look at them using that, those types of equity questions. Any other thoughts before we take a first look at 951? The main thought that I've got is um, just to give a little bit more to, to give a little bit more thought to our opening preamble in terms of purpose. Um, why do we have this? Why we have mm -hmm. this policy, and what we're really attempting to achieve with this policy. Um, 
because as you mentioned, you know, this really, I mean, there's a lot of overlap with what we're doing in other areas, and um, I guess I'm, 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 myself, I'm struggling to put it all in, in context um, mm -hmm. and to understand, to understand what this policy is bringing that we don't have covered elsewhere, unless, unless it's the, and I, I don't know if it's the assignment of responsibility, um, I'm just not 100% clear on that. Okay. We can look at the general statement of policy and take a look at that and make sure to do some specific alignment. Um, one piece, you know, one of the ways I connect policies to then superintendent goals, strategic plan, and our action is you think about how we've talked about many times as a board, um, you've set a vision for transparent communication, you've set a vision for engaging the wide range of families and constituents throughout our organization. Um, to me, this policy is or should speak to the board's intent through policy um, to charge the superintendent and our organization with engaging in that work. Um, and so I feel like a lot of the work we discuss, um, talking about our communication and our communications audit and the work that we're doing, um, comes out directly or indirectly from some of this work. Um, and while that's not clearly articulated there, I believe that that's, that's a pretty significant intent to the policy. It's also some of the intent of all of the policies that you all work as the governing organization um, and the governing group, which is to create policies that charge our administrative team with, with procedures and guidelines to implement for our, for our team and for our system. All right, adding on to that is board policy 951, parent, student, and community involvement. Um, and similarly, this is about um, figuring out ways to effectively um, involve and maintain and establish effective partnerships with our families um, and advisories. Um, and also sharing information. This is a very similar policy to 926. Um, but it also talks about um, advisory committees um, and guidelines related to those pieces. Um, and then also figuring out ways to effectively gather and solicit community input um, and having some mechanisms in which to do that. Um, it's also a good place as we think about that equity component and thinking back to a question uh, Board Member Brackey has asked on multiple occasions is how are we going to proactively communicate because it's one of the things that's not necessarily in this policy but I think it's also very much in the intentions of the Board. How do we proactively communicate in a way that engages underserved families or underrepresented families in our advisory committees, in our survey mechanisms and in the ways that we work to communicate? How are we making sure that the response and the engagement is representative across our organization? Um, and similarly aligns to some of those five questions from an equity perspective as we really look at um, taking a look at some of our policies through a different lens, um, as suggested by uh, Chair, Chair Malik. Any other thoughts um, as we go to rework this? The only thought I have, and this is just a question, um, at what point, um, whether it, do, do we feel that it belongs in policy or it belongs in another piece where we talk about ways of measuring um, success at, at achieving the stated goals of the policy? Um, I think the policy itself should suggest that there will be measurement around it. Um, and so um, I would suggest as we look at parent, student, and community involvement, there should probably be an addition saying that the district will openly measure uh, progress um, in this particular area. Um, and that is the board governance component and the guidance that, that you talk about as a governing organization. And then my role as the superintendent and our team's role is to then create guidelines and procedures to follow through on that and also report that back to the board and report that back to the community. Yeah, and I think in general you want policy to be broad and not, not so specific because if we say one measure it could be outdated or could be not as relevant a few years down the line and then you're creating a, an episode where until we review it or until the board then at that time reviews it is subject to having to respond with that measurement even if it's no longer relevant if you if you pick a particular one so I think in general you don't you you may you you may not even have to include a requirement to measure within it if you, you don't wish but it could be something that the individual board would would request it's a good reminder though to have it include the, there, there, to say the board may may you know the board yeah, may it's somewhat implicit in, in yeah. the policy um, <clears throat> that you're going to make some effort to assess your success. Yeah. But, uh, yeah. 
whether it needs to be stated in style. All right. We will revise, um, make some changes, um, look at it using multiple methods, um, and bring things back. And just as a reminder, if I heard correctly, um, we'll be sending 206 to board member Bracky to get in the weeds and <laughs> have her take a swing at it and do some of that work for us. Well done. Yeah, I believe Dr. There. Tensing also agreed to do that. So it's in we'll, good hands. That's right. That's right. So I appreciate that extra support. It is very much appreciated. Thank you. Uh, just a quick piece of information for you that um, on February 6th, the board approved our submission of our district pay equity compliance report. That specifically is looking at our compensation practices for male dominated versus female dominated job classifications. Um, we received um, the results of that back in August that showed that we are in compliance, that our submission was timely. Um, we responded to a few questions in the interim and that test was determined to be accurate. And so we are in compliance yet again um, with our pay equity as it relates to the state required salary. We have a certificate in the packet as well to support that. We don't get a certificate to take off, do we? <laughs> you can have a certificate to take off. I can quickly put this off for you. I think this fancy is yours that was delivered earlier, though. Yeah, thanks, Greg. I have no questions. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so we don't need to do anything no, with that. Legislative update. Okay, so we move on to legislative update and Superintendent Unowski. All right, so a couple of things. Obviously, you have a gigantic 62 page document in your board packet. I was reflecting on the awkwardness um, with which I present at times legislative updates and trying to explain to you why sometimes I say, well, there's a lot, but it's kind of hard to describe. Um, so I decided that rather than walk through a gigantic number of pieces, um, this is what's provided through us through our partnership with AMSD. Um, they share out um, basically a lot of the work um, that occurs within um, our legislature and they help summarize things for us. Um, and they also partner with MDE um, in terms of the communication of that. Um, and so within our board pack, we have a large 62 page MDE document, um, a summary of the special session work and summary of the work that occurred at the legislature to sort of give that information to us and to also to our constituents. Um, I don't plan on walking through it, but want, to, want us to know publicly that that is available on our website. And obviously that has been sent out to all board members. Um, the other component I would want to point out legislatively, obviously something pretty significant happened uh, within the federal government recently as um, President Trump shared a different view and his um, intent to rescind um, DACA or the DREAM Act um, and looking at how do we work within our community to make sure that we are um, continuing to provide those clear messages of support and concern for our families. Um, noting that we've been working very hard to try to determine what this actually means, how this might impact members of our organization, how this might impact students and members of our community. Um, we will be communicating out um, probably tomorrow um, and we're working on composing a letter um, to send out to our community, um, just sort of reiterating our stance as we're here to serve all students, we're here to serve all families and we will provide the most safe and effective educational um, and community-based environment um, for all the constituents of Richfield Public Schools. Um, and so we're working on that and we'll be very clear and transparent in our communications as we have been in the past um, with things that have happened obviously within the larger legislative picture. So this is, I'm gonna uh, bounce back. Thank you, first, first of all, thank you very much for mm -hmm. presenting that information. And, and I would encourage, um, as Steve mentioned, the, the whole document is available on the website. I would encourage anyone who's interested to go out and, and peruse it. Um, and you can see um, some of those details of, of what the legislature's been up to. I wanted to reflect back to a comment earlier that Crystal made regarding the uh, known shortage of guidance counselors in Minnesota. And um, I believe it was Senator Weger who had talked, maybe, I don't know if he actually offered up any type of legislation this past session or if they had talked about it, um, about actually doing something about that in the legislature. Steve, do you know, is that something that AMSD has looked at or could we maybe? 
believe that there is an MDE sponsored grant um, that supports um, matched funding on some levels in regard to uh, counselors and social workers within schools. Um, and we've been looking and examining if and how that would work within our own funding um, and to see, to see if those pieces are effective for Richfield Public Schools. With AMSD, uh, with our partners at AMSD, if that might be an item that we would be interested in bringing forward as part of a platform, a policy platform. So one of the challenges, um, and I'll, and, and again, I will just remind that my original bachelor's degree is in child psychology, my master's is in ed psychology, so I'm trained as a counselor. Um, and so it is an area that I tend to support and obviously have feelings about. Um, I think when we as an organization get into advocating for certain FTE or certain areas, even though we might agree that um, an addition or an increase of counselors would be highly successful and important within our organization, um, it's a pretty, pretty awkward and shaky ground we get on. Um, because I think we would also agree that there's a wide range of pieces that if we had full funding for every need we would have. Um, and so I think if we are to engage in that conversation, we want to be very careful. Um, to make sure that we're not advocating for one set of resources to one group over another, um, because that can be a very dangerous slope, regardless of where we might feel. I, uh, I'll, can you yeah, go yeah, first? Okay. I think I think what how it was phrased last year um, was that you know the most flexible avenue for districts is to is to address the general funding formula, and if a district is so motivated. It can take it can take those those funds, which are for any purpose, and allocate them to whatever they feel is most important. And so, if we start carving out counselors versus any other sort of educational support role or direct teaching role or whatever, we, we start getting into you know there's suddenly there's a hundred buckets um, when really one big bucket should you would like to think would be would be the, the right way to address it. And if, if a community or a board or a district were so motivated as to funnel more towards one resource for, over another, that would be their choice. And I, uh, I think to follow up on what you were saying about the, the change in approach to, you know, the council roles here in our high school, I am very interested to hear more about because I do think the, the right orientation for us right now is to make that move from the reactive to the proactive model as you described and then see what does what does that approach demand of us in terms of providing the right number of people to be able to meet the needs of our students and so i think it will be really really helpful and useful to hear what we are learning as that transition from reactive to proactive takes place and I mean just as you were describing it I was thinking my goodness that sounds like it's going to be four times the amount of work than what they're currently doing just in the reactive you know uh, space so I think hearing what we learn the needs actually are will hopefully then help inform choices that uh, we may need to make as a district. So this is a helpful conversation. Um, it's obviously based upon not only your observation, Crystal, or the data that you shared with us, yeah. also you know, what we've heard from other districts, it's clear that there, there's probably something more system, systemic influencing where Minnesota stands relative mm -hmm. to other states with our ratio of counselors to students, um, perhaps more systemic than just individual district choices along the way. I don't know what those pieces would be. Um, but I guess it's something for us to kind of keep our eye on and, and understand if there's a... Right. Okay. I think, you know, as we've begun to talk about referendum and we've begun to have conversations reminding our taxpayers that um, if funding from the state had kept pace with just inflation, we'd have over the last 10 years $600 more per student. I think sadly, and again, I'm going to remind, trained as a counselor, um, there are areas that are sadly more likely for reductions than others. Um, and so I don't think the reduction or the ratio of counselors is a function of not valuing the counselor role, um, because I think we value that very much. Um, I think that as we begin to look at, you know, the funding component in schools and all those pieces that we have that are vital to the functioning of our students and our families, um, we just 
don't have that same level of support from a state funding perspective that would allow all of those pieces to occur in the way we would like them to. Um, and so we end up making some very tough decisions in organiz school organizations um, that, that are obviously challenging to the things we want to accomplish and we feel like are, are necessary for the, for the highest level functioning of our team. And there are, if, if you want to read more about it, even just Googling Minnesota school counselors will provide a wealth of stories and information, I think, about why we are where we are and some of the funding things that have been proposed or explored, uh, at least in recent years, to try and address it. Hmm. I would add that potentially, if, although it may sound like more work to shift to a proactive model, there may be enough prevention to actually yeah. decrease the potential yeah. workload if you're going at right. it in a proactive yeah. way. So it, it may turn out to yeah. be a benefit. We'll hope that an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure, yes. right? Yes. Okay, so moving on to information and questions from the board. Um, I just want to say I appreciate you sharing what you shared just a moment ago about DACA. And, um, you know, I, I think our kids and community have definitely been on my mind and my heart all day and thinking about, I think, some of the, the fear and unknown uh, that exists right now um, for people who are very close to us. So I appreciate what you said and really I'm glad that the district is going to be sharing some information with the community and look forward to getting that. Um, and then on a abrupt change, um, I wanted to appreciate Christine um, for your wonderful remarks at the staff kickoff um, last week. It was so great, and I know Paula was the only board member who couldn't be there because you were teaching in your own classroom. <laughs> Which is um, great. It, it was <laughs> great. <laughs> you deserve appreciation too. Um, but I just I thought uh, I thought you did a great job with your remarks and representing us as a board. And I just want to appreciate the staff overall because I thought it was a really great two hours um, to set the tone for this next school year. I thought there was a lot of fun. There was a lot of heart. Um, I thought hearing from our Teacher of the Year finalist, Ms. Statham, at RCEP was amazing, um, and it was just really wonderful to be a part of it, and I'm super grateful for all that people did to make that happen. I would agree. It's one of the really fun things about being on the board, being able to attend that kickoff yeah. the beginning of school, and everybody coming back, and all the excitement. So, thanks. I want to echo what Crystal said about Steve's remarks on DACA. I have been unusually quiet this evening. I am personally hurt by the news. I am uh, feeling very worried about tomorrow morning at school with my students, and I assume that will be the case for many of our students here at RPS. Uh, so our hearts are with everyone. Uh, and uh, on another note, I'd like to say that I am very uh, pleased as a parent to have received several uh, communications from teachers, from uh, special education uh, staff about, you know, who will be dealing with my child. Uh, so I'm excited to see all the intent in communicating with parents uh, even before school started and also that I have uh, spoken to people outside uh, circles and heard about a heavy emphasis on equity from the training and teach and all the training that happened before uh, our students arrived. Uh, so I'm very happy to hear that the things that we talk about that in this during our meetings are being put into you know being rolled out as we as we start the, the new year. So thank you. Thank you. Uh, we'll move on to future meeting dates. Our next meeting is September 18th, Monday, 7 p.m., um, a regular um, regular board meeting, um, followed on October 2nd, 2017, a Monday again, 7 p.m., regular board meeting, but which will be hosted by RHS, and I know they will have lots of interesting things to present at that meeting. I look forward to that. Um, any suggested future agenda items? So 
then we can move on. I believe we have a closed session scheduled tonight. So if someone would like to would like to make a motion to move into closed session. I move we move into closed session. I'll second the motion. Okay, we have a motion by Mr. Ashby, the second by Mr. Paulus, or Mr. Paulus, Mr. Jensen, <laughs> to move to closed session in alignment with Minnesota Statute 13D03 for teacher contract negotiations. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? The chair votes aye, and we now move on to, clo to closed session after a short recess.